Well, as our world enters 2009, much of the West enters the new year with a sense of fear, a sense at least of uncertainty due to the global economic crisis. Recent months have seen the media in a frenzy in many ways as they scramble to put in front of us all the latest data, all the latest graphs about how bad things are getting and how much worse they may yet become. We're bombarded with it daily. As the negative financial news continues to flow off the press as it's beamed into our living rooms on our televisions, we are being informed that it's This is not something that's confined to one country in the world, that this has become a global issue. That this is not some little blimp on the radar, this is not some little pimple on the graph, but this is big, real big. It's a crisis. And yet I somehow suspect that there are many people in the world this afternoon and probably not a few of you who have been tempted to think doesn't seem like a crisis to me. I mean, I don't feel any different. Life seems to be going on relatively smoothly for me and my family. Is this really a crisis? And yet whether we feel it or not, all the data, all the facts that, if that's what they are, that are are put before us are pointing to this one conclusion that there is a global financial problem and perhaps crisis is not too strong of a word. Those of you who are familiar with the ministry of this church will know that you do not come here to hear the latest news and current affairs. This pulpit is not used to talk about political policies or some economic strategies. I stand behind this pulpit this afternoon simply to proclaim to you the good news about Jesus Christ. But friends, I do believe that this current economic crisis does provide for us something of a unique opportunity to preach the gospel. And I'd like us to consider this morning, what's, or this evening, what's printed on the front cover of your song sheet, the global economic crisis and the gospel and the good news. Or if you like, mankind's true global crisis. You see, just as many of us might not acknowledge or even feel like there's some global financial crisis unfolding, there are even fewer today who are willing to acknowledge that there is in our world right now a global spiritual crisis. Whether it feels like a crisis or not, this globe right now now is in the grip of a spiritual crisis. And that's not some problem that's confined to one nation or to one culture. It is truly global. All humanity is affected by this spiritual crisis. So whatever your feelings might be saying to you, what the Bible says is very clear on this point. And if you're not a Christian this afternoon, you yourself are in a spiritual crisis before God. And we want you to hear the good news about Jesus Christ. You see, the gospel is effectively what we might call God's bailout plan. So the first thing I want us to think about this evening, this afternoon, is the global crisis for man the global crisis for man and then we'll look at God's gracious bailout plan well what we've been told in the recent past about the current financial crisis in the world are many things 
And perhaps as we begin to think about that, there are a number of things that run through your mind, what some of them might be in the recent past. For many months, at six on the nightly news, much doom and gloom has been reported about the US economy. It was just last October, toward the start of that month, while I was sitting in the Los Angeles airport waiting for a connecting flight, sitting, minding my own business, having a coffee, feeling sorry for myself because I just dropped my laptop and it was broken on the side and looking over at the table were some other fellows, there's about half a dozen of them, their laptop was working and they're all huddled around their table with their coffee, all looking at the screen of their laptop, they're on the internet. You know what they were doing? They were looking at what was happening with the US stock market and I was close enough to their table to overhear their conversation. Their whole conversation was about, I wonder what might happen with these stocks. I wonder what might happen here or there. September, October last year saw the global stock market in a drastic freefall. There have been large companies go broke in the US in the recent past and with the US being the largest economy in the world, the thinking has been, or at least initially was, if it falls over, then we'll all fall over. All of this is pointing to the financial crisis of man, or for man. But it's not just the bad news about the past from America. Japan, the second largest economy in the world, is declared, it's been declared recently in the past, to be in recession. Past declarations have been that the European Union, the UK, New Zealand are all in recession. In mid-October 2008, a measure of shipping volume fed, fell by 50% in one week. That's an indication of the falling global exports. The recent past has declared this global crisis for men. That's the past, the recent past. But when we think about the present, I don't think it gets any better. Just last week, if you heard the news, just last week, the 250-year-old company, Wedgwood, we're known for Royal Dalton, China, where? Had to call in the administrators to its UK arm. 250-year-old company looking like it might fall over. It was also on Tuesday in the UK, 700 Woolworth stores closed down. I think it was Friday, was it, that they announced the Bank of England was lowering its interest rates to the lowest in its history, which started in 1694, over 300 years. Coming closer to home on the 31st of December in our own country, 55 ABC learning childcare facilities were closed. One wonders which company will be next as we think about the present global economic crisis. But from what we're told, the future doesn't look any brighter. On the 29th of December, there were dire predictions given about employment for the next year. And in the UK, it was said that they were expecting that there would be 600,000 job losses in 2009. Hundreds, if not thousands, of jobs are predicted to go in the future in Australia, in the once booming mining sector. A few days ago, I found this amazing statistic that the International Labour Organization predicted, has predicted globally, just a couple of days ago, two, sorry, 20 million jobs worldwide, globally, will be lost in this next year. Bringing worldwide unemployment to the highest it has ever been in history. The past, the present, and the future all declare the same message, the global crisis for man. But as I said before, we're not actually here to talk about economics. It's just providing us the link to think about the Bible. I wanted to suggest to you 
that as bad as all the economic data is in this whole situation, the economic issue globally is not the greatest problem facing mankind at all. Think of the global problem. Turn on the six o'clock nightly news and listen for another global problem. <laughs> and you'll hear about global warming, won't you? That'll be the other thing that is spoken about. It's either climate change or the economy. The nightly news at six doesn't directly report, though in a way it does, but not directly report about the real global crisis. For the real global crisis for mankind is our rebellion toward God and His condemnation that we are now under. It's the global spiritual crisis that should concern each of us more today than the financial crisis. Now, I know for some of you, you have real concerns about the financial crisis because it's cost you. But our concern should be heightened for the spiritual crisis. We don't turn the TV on to learn about the spiritual crisis. Where do we go? Well, we go to this book that remains ever relevant. We go to the Bible. And the Bible isn't a, a script for some news reader to read. It's not a record of some interview between some human reporters. Effectively, the Bible is God's own inerrant record of what mankind has done, what God has done, what God is doing, and what God will yet do to the world which he made. You see, the Bible speaks about the global spiritual crisis for mankind in terms of the past, the present, and the future. You think about it. The past, the opening pages of the Bible declare that God made this world, and that includes humanity, and that when God made Adam from the dust of the ground, that God made him upright, God made him without sin. Mankind was made in harmony with God. But by chapter 3 of Genesis, what do we find? Man sinned. Man rebelled against God's command. He turned his back against God. Adam and Eve dis disobeyed God. And that therefore meant that they brought the condemnation of God upon them. The harmony between God and mankind was broken. The man and the woman became an enemy of God. But this fact of the past not only brought them under condemnation, God's condemnation, but the Bible also teaches that their descendants, all their descendants, including you and me, are born into this world with a corrupt nature. We have a rebellious heart toward God. I'm going to quote several verses from the book of Romans. And Paul says in the book of Romans in chapter 8, speaking about what our hearts are like, he says the carnal mind is enmity against God. It is not subject to the law of God, neither indeed can it be. And friends, it's not just some isolated problem. It's not just some problem that's confined to one corner of the globe. It is global. Romans chapter 3 verse 23 says, All have sinned and all fall short of the glory of God. You see, this is the great global crisis. All are in this category. Not everyone is feeling or will suffer the effects of the global financial crisis. There are some who will profit from it. But all globally have fallen. All have sinned. Some of the talk that has come out of Canberra is that they're hopeful that Australia might be partially immune from the full impact of the financial crisis sweeping the West. We hope that's true, don't we? That we would be partially immune from what's happening elsewhere. But no nation is immune from the global spiritual crisis. There's not one family, there's not one un individual who is immune. All is all. All have sinned and all have fallen short of the glory of God. And Paul says in Romans chapter 1, 
and in verse 18. The wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men. You see, it's not just the crisis of sin and rebellion to God, but it's also really where that sin leaves us before God. The Bible declares it leaves us all under the wrath of God. And that's not just something about the past with Adam and Eve and the Garden of Eden they got kicked out of the garden. It's also something about the present. Again, Romans chapter 1 and verse 18 makes it really plain for it says the wrath of God is revealed and that, that's in the present tense. This is current. This is active. The wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men. That means, friends, that's today. This is in the present. Paul goes on in Romans chapter 1 to describe, I believe, our very world with all of its perversion. Listen to what he says. Men leaving the natural use of the women burning in their lusts for one another, men with men committing what is shameful. He then says people full of envy, murder, strife, deceit, violence, inventors of evil things, disobedient to parents, untrustworthy. Actually, aren't some of those things, the very things that are reported on six o'clock nightly news. It's like the police are always trying to catch up with the latest thing the criminals have done, inventing new evil. Murders, deceit, stealing from one another, ripping one another off, lying to one another, violence. God's wrath. God's condemnation is actively revealed in this present world. It is the global crisis for man. It's not just past. It is present. But of course it's not just about the rebellion of others, about those horrible people we see on the 6 o'clock news. It's about us. We all sin. We have sinned today. We all fall short of the glory of God. For all have sinned. That includes us. And if you are not a Christian, then the Bible's true declaration is that you are right now, at this very present moment, right now, you are under God's condemnation. Romans chapter 8 and verse 1 says, There is now... No condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus. We sort of reverse that or flip it around the other way. Listen to what it says. There is now condemnation to those who are not in Christ Jesus. That's now. So if you're not in Christ, it's another way of actually saying if you're not a Christian, then you're under God's condemnation now. You see, my friend, you are in a spiritual crisis before God. You have actually rebelled against God. You've broken his holy law and you're right now under his condemnation. It's about the past, yes. But it's also about the present, but it's also about the future. The global spiritual crisis is about also what's to come. Globally, well, the Bible predicts what's going to happen in the future, what God will do to those who have rebelled against him. The language of the Apostle Paul in 2 Thessalonians chapter 1 is really clear. Speaking about the future global crisis, he says, when the Lord Jesus is revealed from heaven with his mighty angels in flaming fire, taking vengeance on those who do not know God and on those who do not obey the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, these shall be punished with everlasting destruction. Everlasting, that's the future. Never ending into the future. The global crisis 
for man for some of you it's your crisis you see friends this is not about interest rates this is not about the falling Australian dollar or the rising Australian dollar or wherever it may be today it's not about the price of petrol it's not about some loss on the stock market this is about your never dying soul this is about the wrath of God this is about the eternity of condemnation that lies before you if you are not a Christian you may not feel like you're in a crisis but all the Bible facts point to this one irrefutable conclusion you have a spiritual crisis now in recent weeks and months various governments around the world have come out with their bailout plans as they are calling them you remember the US government eventually had passed their 700 billion dollar bailout plan only the last couple of days the president-elect Obama has uh, been talking about another US bailout to come when he becomes president he's asking for another 700 800 billion dollars Japan talked about spending 10 trillion yen to bail out their economy it was on the 10th of November Mr Rudd announced a 6.2 billion bailout plan for the Australian car manufacturing industry all this talk about bailout plans well that's all well and good but again friends it's nothing compared to God's bailout plan and just as mankind's spiritual crisis is the greatest crisis so too God's bailout plan is the greatest plan not just of this last few months or this last century but of all time think with me then secondly and finally God's gracious bailout plan and if you have your Bible I might ask that you would turn now to the book of 2 Corinthians and chapter 8 and verse 9 2 Corinthians 8 verse 9 here God's bailout plan is put in terms of rich and poor so it's relevant language is it not to this theme 2 Corinthians 8 verse 9 for you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ that though he was rich yet for your sakes he became poor that you through his poverty might become rich for this whole financial meltdown many people in recent months some even overnight have gone from rich to poor big government surpluses have turned into deficits self pardon me self-funded retirees had discovered their struggles with the falling interest rates they had gone from a category where we may have said they are rich and now they're heading towards poor superannuation funds which are supposed to be making money are losing money I have a, a very little superannuation fund and I saw my statement and oh, I'm losing money I don't have much to lose but a little bit there it's going backwards I know of people and maybe you do too personally who have lost their entire retirement nest egg due to the stock market fall the language of this verse rich to poor is very fitting and here we see God's bailout plan primarily in the second half of the verse where it says though he was rich that for your sakes he became poor that you through his poverty might become rich but notice the first part of the verse for he says for you know this is something we need to know this is something about Jesus Christ we need to know and as it says in the first part of the verse it's all about grace this is not about uh, what anyone deserves this is not God's own favour this, this is rather God's own favour to undeserved sinners the language of the verse says the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ 
God's gracious bailout plan for the global crisis for man. Friends, when we see these words in this verse, rich and poor, we should not jump straight away and think dollars and economics. Remember, as we've seen, the current financial crisis is not man's greatest problem. Ours is a spiritual crisis. And yet here we have a beautiful summary statement of God's gracious bailout plan. We see firstly the plan in this verse and then we see the purpose. Let's briefly look at those things. See the plan? Verse 9 there, halfway through. Though he was rich, yet for your sakes he became poor. He was rich. Who's the he? Paul's told us already at the start of the verse, he's speaking about the Lord Jesus Christ. He was rich. Rich in his position. Rich in his possessions. Rich in his person. Who is he? Well, Jesus is part of the eternal triune God, Father, Son and Holy Spirit. Jesus Christ is God. Rich in his person. His own words in John 17 and verse 5 where he prays to God the Father, O Father, glorify me with the glory which I had with you before the world was. He was rich. He had the glory of God. He's rich in his possessions. Jesus was involved in creating this entire universe. He owns it all. It's his. Psalm 50 says, Every beast of the forest is mine, and the cattle on a thousand hills, the world is mine, and all its fullness. So yes, China may buy our coal, and Rio Tinto, Tinto may sell it, and the government may get their royalties, but the Bible teaches us that Jesus owns it. Rich in his person, rich in his possessions, rich in his position. He dwelt on high with his father from eternity past. The angels did his bidding before he came as a little babe. Colossians 1 says, all things were created through him and they were created for him. How rich was he in that position? And yet our verse says to us, he left it all behind. Though he was rich, he became poor. Such was his love. That in the midst of all of his richness, he thought of us. He took on our cause. What did that mean? Though he was rich, Yet for your sakes he became poor. He did this for poor, undeserving, rebellious sinners. He was not made poor. He became poor. So something he chose to do and he did it in obedience to his father's plan. He left his throne there in glory and as the verse says, he became poor. Think about his life. Think about the Christmas story. Think about his life. Think about his death. He became poor. The eternal Son of God somehow took on a human body. And when he was born, he was born into abject poverty. He wasn't placed in a golden crib. He wasn't wrapped up with sheets of silk in some opulent palace. He's born in a cattle shed. He's lying in a feeding trough. Surrounded perhaps by animals, imagine the stench, the smell of fresh manure and stale urine. That's where he was laid. He was rich, yes, but he became poor. He who once made the stars and the galaxies. In his youth, where does he work? In a humble carpenter's shop, making chairs and tables. He was rich. He became poor. Throughout his own adult life, he never had his own house. He had to stay with someone else. 
We sang the line before of the scripture in that last song, foxes have dens, birds of the air have nests, but the Son of Man has nowhere to lay his head. When he crossed the Sea of Galilee, he had to go in someone else's boat. When he rode into Jerusalem, he had to ride on someone else's donkey. And even in his death, he was laid in someone else's tomb. Though he was rich, he became poor. He who had ruled the universe became poor. He was rejected by men. He came to his own, but his own did not receive him. Yet, friends, the greatest and the clearest aspect of his poverty in this world is what happened at his death. The sinless, spotless Son of God was made sin for us. The eternally holy Son was made sin for us. Rich in all of his holiness, he became poor. There as he hung on the cross, bearing our sin, his Father in heaven turned his back and forsook him. Rich, poor. Jesus endured the wrath of God for all the sin that he bore. Why? What? Why? Why would he do that? Why would one so rich choose to become poor? That's the second and the last thing tonight, the purpose. See the plan, it's there. The purpose is here in the verse. The verse says, Yet for your sakes he became poor, that you, through his poverty, might become rich. This purpose is something personal. Yet for your sakes he became poor, that you, through his poverty, might become rich. Jesus became poor. He identified himself with sinful men and women, but not just identified with them, he represented them. He stood in their place. He became the sinner's great substitute. Jesus lived a life that none of us would ever have been able to live. It was a perfect life. And he died the death that none of us would ever dare to die. He endured the wrath of God in the place of sinners. He bore the punishment that is rightly sinners. So that now, all of those who would turn from their sins and place their personal trust in him might become rich. Again the verse. For your sakes he became poor. That you through his poverty might become rich. And what are the riches that are being spoken about here? Well, again, he's not speaking about fat wallets. He's not speaking about wealthy retirement packages. Remember what he's speaking about. This is God's gracious bailout plan for the global spiritual crisis of man. These are spiritual riches that he's speaking about here. You see, Jesus became poor so that you might no longer be an enemy of your Creator, but that you might be at peace with God through Jesus Christ. You might no longer be under the wrath of God for there is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. If you would call out to God in prayer tonight and ask him to save you, you will be rich in spiritual blessings. Your sins, absolutely all of your sins, will be washed away. You'll be given the wonderful gift of forgiveness. You'll be given the gift of the Holy Spirit. You'll be made part of the worldwide family of God. You'll become an heir of God, a joint heir with Christ. You have reserved for you an eternal place in heaven if you would become a Christian. Though he was rich, yet for your sakes he became poor, that you, through his poverty, might become rich. Paul says in Romans 8.32, 
He who did not spare his own son, but delivered him up for us all, how shall he, that very same God, how shall he not with him also freely give us all things, all things we need, he will give. For your sakes, he became poor, that you, through his poverty, might become rich. The governments of the Western world have put into place their bailout plans not really knowing whether it will work. They hope it will work and I'm sure we hope it will work but at the end of the day they just don't know. But friends, God's bailout plan isn't anything like that. God's gracious bailout plan truly works. I stand before you to testify it about tonight. There are many of you sitting here who would rise up if I asked you and you would testify that God's bailout plan works for you. Millions down through the centuries have proven God's gracious bailout plan really does work. My friend, why continue going on choosing poverty? Choosing to live under the condemnation of God when spiritual freedom and spiritual riches are available in Jesus Christ. I'm persuaded that there are some of you here who are not yet a Christian. Right now you are in a spiritual crisis before God. Forget about how you feel The facts of the Bible conclude you are in a spiritual crisis. Will you not call out to God in prayer right now and plead with him to save your never dying soul? Will you not embrace God's gracious bailout plan for you in your spiritual crisis? Though he was rich, yet for your sake, he became poor, that you, through his poverty, might become rich. We prayed for you before you got here. We prayed that you would believe on the Lord Jesus Christ tonight and be saved. May God be pleased to hear our prayers and hear yours as well. Let's pray.